So last week we began this sermon series, Intentional Marriage. And if you want anything to succeed, it's got to be intentional. Now I know not everyone's married. Maybe someday you will be. Uh, I have a feeling you know someone who is, who might need some encouragement. And really, the series is, uh, really, it's a relationship series that we're probably going to illustrate, uh, you know, through marriage a lot. But uh, hang in there with us. Uh, It's going to be a month of investing in relationships with targeting marriage. And we're so thankful that you're here. I'm really uh, excited about some resources we have for you on our we- website. We have a resource page. Uh, you might want to check that out. Need some extra help, some things to talk about, some good stuff there on our resource page, and it's a good thing. I'm excited today that um, Eric Denny uh, is here to preach for us today. Eric was our keynote speaker yesterday at our marriage conference and uh, did a great job, and I'm excited for him to be here today. Eric is the family and marriage life minister at the Creek in Indianapolis, Indiana, and, um, but I really most appreciate him because he is actually my Micah's father-in-law. So Micah and Ken's, you know, this is Ken's daddy, and so Eric, I think that makes us outlaws, <laughs> right? So, uh, but I, I am so thankful for him. I so appreciate him. I love his spirit. I love his heart. I love what he's going to share with you today. And so would you uh, help me by giving a warm, crossing welcome to Eric Denny. Well, thank you guys very much. What a welcome. What an honor to be here. Happy New Year's, right? We're only two weeks into the New Year's, and so uh, whether you're online, whether you're joining us here in person, uh, I am really just honored and appreciate being here. It's so cool to be able to come and share with Mark. I was just introduced to the McGee family uh, a few years ago. I work with a gentleman that that some of you guys know. His name is Gary Johnson. He's been here a number of times, and so there was a few years ago that my oldest daughter went away to college, a single girl. And she called one weekend and wanted to bring a boy home to meet. (laughs) And so Marcy and I were at home and we were kind of preparing the house for company. And and I even printed out this application to date my daughter that I put on Micah's bed. It it had questions such as, do you own a van? And if if you were to be shot, what body part would you least like to be shot in? And I still have that if anybody would ever need to see it. But anyway, that day, while Marcy and I are kind of processing that, that day, uh, Gary Johnson called me, and he's a good friend. Like I said, whenever I pick up the phone, his first words are, I hear you're going to meet your son-in-law tonight. I'm like, do what? And he says, yeah. And come to find out, he was in Delaware. He said, I am actually riding right now in one of my best friend's Jeep. His name is Mark. Mark has a, has a son named Micah that he was just telling me is on his way to Indianapolis to meet the parents of this girl he's interested in. And he said, and I find out it's little Miss McKenzie. He said, you're going to meet your son-in-law tonight. And I am so grateful that Micah became my son-in-law. And I'm grateful that we get to do life together. And we are part of the same clan. So... It's a cool world. I would love to pray before uh, we do anything, really. Jesus, I am so grateful for who you are. I'm grateful, Jesus, for your spirit, for your love for us, for what you have done for us and the way that you just long to be with us. So, Jesus, interact with us today. You, Lord, make this morning special, uh, that we hear from you and that we are moved by you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Just a super quick idea of who I am. Yeah, my name's Eric, married, uh, love of my life. Her name's Marcy. We have uh, six kids together. Um, uh, 
Two of them have welcomed kids by choice into the family, you know, including Micah. We have six grandchildren. Um, we have served at a church for about 20 years, uh, kind of like uh, Mark's been here for about 30 years. So we love having roots and family and community. Life is good, and we really appreciate being invited in. I'll introduce you to Marcy here in a second. I did want to touch real quick on what we did yesterday. Yesterday, we did a, a small uh, marriage conference. I say small, almost 100 of us were here gathered together to talk about God, to talk about marriage, and there were three main principles that we kind of focused on for the whole afternoon. The first one was that we need to believe God more than we believe the world. All of us need to believe God more than we believe the world. That the best thing we can do for our marriage is to nurture our own personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And that we have to take a good, long, hard look to determine exactly where we're at so that we can define a next step to move us closer to a Christ-centered marriage. And I share those, one, because we are in the middle of a uh, marriage sermon series that you guys are working your way through. But I also share them that because... Just because we talked about those in the context of marriage, those three principles are vital to us. They are equally important to those of us who are not married. Like life is about relationship with Jesus and and everything that we are doing here, everything that we're talking about is relevant both for those of us who are married and those of us who are not. And I just kind of wanted to say that before we get started. I'd love to show you a picture of my bride. She was not able to be here with us. This is a picture you may recognize. It is a couple years old. It's not, yeah. I don't know why that was so funny, both hours. But it was a picture. So I met my wife, uh, actually, while she had a pretty serious boyfriend. She'd been dating a young man for a number of years. And ironically, I had been dating a gal for a number of years. But conveniently, we had a mutual friend. It happened to be her boyfriend. And, uh, and so we ended up in the same circle on occasions, and we just met each other as acquaintances. Then her and her mom opened a beauty salon in, uh, in the area that we live, and I would occasionally go there and get my hair cut. One day I was there, and I was getting my hair cut, and I just happened to ask about her boyfriend. Come to find out they had recently broke up which was kind of good news because I had just recently broke up with my girlfriend. So whenever I was paying, I said, hey, would you be willing to go to a movie with me? She said, yes, this is 1990, so I waited two weeks before I called her again because you don't want to seem too desperate, right? Those of us who are older can attest to that. We had a second date, and ever since that second date, we literally were together every single day until three months later, whenever we took that picture and our engagement pictures, because we were engaged. You see, there's something super exciting about a new relationship, right? We love all the excitement, the anticipation, what can be whenever we step into a new relationship. And I share that because the passage that we're going to look at opens up with an invitation, an invitation from Jesus to come to me. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 11, verse 25 is where uh, I'm going to read to start off with. Jesus says these words, he says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus Jesus invites us in to a relationship with him. Come to me. He wants to, he wants to welcome, not to go see a movie. He wants to be in relationship, but come to me. And he continues, he says, anyone who is weary and burdened. And I wonder, and I'm not going to do this, but I wonder if I were to ask how many of us are weary and burdened. Probably a whole lot of us. You know, we know that going into 2024, 40% of all Americans started a New Year's resolution because of something that we wanted to change about ourselves. Usually our weight, our finances, our relationships. And, And something new is new and exciting, and then we get tired of it. So by the beginning of February, 50% of us will have already given up on our New Year's resolution. In in 2025, when we celebrate the new year again, only 8% of the people will have either achieved their goal or will still be working on it. 92% will have given up because we love the excitement, we love what's new, and then we get tired and we get weary. There was a study by the, uh, 
by the Anxiety and Depression Association of America in 2022, it found that 40 million adults suffer from an anxiety disorder. 40 million. That 75% of those recognize that or are diagnosed by that before the age of 22. And that 85% of them have had some point within the last 12 months that they felt like they could not continue. Another study post-pandemic by the, uh, by the Psychological Association of America, I believe it's called, they just did random surveys. And of them, 33% of all the adults that they asked to rate their stress level on a level from 1 to 10, 33% of them said that their stress daily is between 8 and 10. 33% of all parents said that their stress level is between 8 and 10. Things like finances, health, uh, relationships. And and what happens whenever those kind of take over us is is that we become, uh, we struggle to focus, we have less patience for others, we feel numb. All of these struggles suggest that we are not living in peace. And many times I hear this passage referenced, not necessarily from a pulpit, but from a friend, from a meme on on Facebook or, you know, some sort of social media. And and it's kind of portrayed like this. It's portrayed that, well, I bought a car that I really couldn't afford, and now insurance rates have skyrocketed, and I can't make my insurance car payment, and now I got a flat tire, and I am so stressed, and I'm going to hand this over to God. And he's going to take my stress away from me. Or maybe I've stepped into a really bad relationship. And this person wasn't making great choices. Now I'm not making great choices. Or it's affecting other relationships that I had that were good. And now my heart's broken. Or, you know, and I'm going to hand this off to God. I don't think that's at all what this passage represents. I think that idea of Jesus kind of puts Jesus in a, in a genie bottle. And we can just kind of rub it and bring him out and let him take our burdens This is talking about a way of life by doing relationship with Jesus. If we back up from passage uh, verse 28, where we read a minute ago, 225, it said this, it said, "At, at that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to the little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you are pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by the Father. No one knows the Son except for the Father, and no one knows the Father except for the Son and those whom the Son chooses to reveal them. See, Jesus acknowledges that there's a system in place where where people can grow closer to God, and yet sometimes that system can be tiresome and burdensome, exhausting. It becomes a list of rules rather than relationship. Jesus is extending a hand for a relationship. There's another translation. There's many translations of Scripture. One is called the message, and it's really a paraphrase of Scripture. I think it does a nice job. I would love to read to you what the, what the message translation of this same verse is. So this is the same thing that we just read. Thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. You've concealed your ways from sophisticates and know-it-alls, but spelled them out clearly to ordinary people. Yes, Father, that's the way you like to work. Jesus resumed talking to the people, but now tenderly. The Father has given me all these things to do and say. This is a unique father-son operation coming out of father and son intimacies and knowledge. No one knows the son the way the father does, nor the father the way the son does. But I'm not keeping it to myself. I'm ready to go over it line by line with anyone who will listen. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Doesn't that sound like heaven on earth? That, my friend, is the kingdom of God. The 
the word that Jesus chooses to use in this invitation is yoke. Come and be yoked with me. I was talking to some friend of mine about this, this service, about this sermon, about this passage, and my friends really encouraged me to, to hone in on this word yoke because there's lots of different generations, lots of different backgrounds. Like We just want to be certain that all of us are acknowledging the same thing when we think of the word yoke, right? So I did what any great theologian would do, and I Googled it, right? And so this is what I found whenever I Googled it. This is the definition of a yoke. Now... I'm not necessarily the smartest person in the room, but I do know that that's not the yoke that Jesus was talking about, all right? And I know that because I remember this. I remember that that is my brain, right? (laughs) And I remember that because I remember this is my brain on drugs, right? And I remember that because I remember that this is my brain on drugs with a side order of bacon, okay? (laughs) Okay. All right, so what a real yoke that's referred to in Scripture is, this is the definition, and here's a picture of it. We'll see up here. It is a wooden cross piece that is fastened over the neck of two animals and attached to the plow or to the cart so that they can pull it together. You see, what Jesus wants is he wants us to work in complete and utter harmony with him. He wants us to be yoked with him connected with him, walking with him, talking with him. He wants to do life with us. He wants to be engaged in our conversations and what we watch on the television, what we listen to on our radio. Jesus wants to be an intricate part of every single thing that we do. And Would you pause for a moment and think about that reality? Jesus, the creator of the world, wants to be in an intimate, close relationship with With you, and with you, and with you, and with me. That is what Jesus is inviting us into. When we develop a relationship with Jesus like that, we begin to believe God's word more than we believe the world, right? Because no matter what, almost everything that I look at, I look at from this perspective of the world. If Jesus were here today, and I were to hold him to the same standard I hold myself to in order to determine if he was a success or not, Jesus would be a failure. He doesn't have even a thousand friends on Facebook. He doesn't have a beautiful wife, a nice home, a pickup truck that he loves, a daughter he gets to come to worship service with, and grandkids he gets to play with. Jesus was homeless and hated. He was beaten and abused and spit on and stripped naked and nailed to a cross to die a criminal's death. And yet Jesus is the single most influential person in the world. Jesus himself, by what he overcame the grave, saved us from a lost world so that we can live in all eternity with Jesus. And that Jesus wants to be in a personal relationship with us. What a beautiful thing. We share this in the midst of a marriage sermon series because being yoked with Jesus is vitally important, right? I will say it again. The single most best thing we can do in our, in our marriage is to work on our personal relationship with Jesus. I need to work to be committed to Jesus, and so does Marcy. And as Marcy pursues Jesus, and I'm pursuing Jesus, we are human, flawed people, and, and we are, are messing that up sometimes. But while we're messing that up, we are yoked with each other, right? Marcy and I have lived together now for 33 years. It's pretty hard not to be yoked with somebody you're living with for 33 years, And yet, Marcy's yoked with Jesus, and I'm yoked with Jesus, and and then Marcy and I are yoked together, and sometimes that's just a beautiful symphony of oneness, and we all kind of walk in the same direction like a three-legged race that's going well. Sometimes, sometimes, I feel like Jesus is telling us we need to go this way, and Marcy feels like Jesus is telling us we need to go this way. Jesus is saying, no, you guys need to be going this way. 
And now we're kind of pushing and shoving and knocking each other down, maybe on purpose, even on occasion, right? But we're certainly not doing this symphony of dance. And it's in these moments that we need to invite Jesus in even stronger. In these moments when we don't want to, when our home isn't necessarily hitting on all the cylinders that we want it to, because we have all this peace and harmony, because we are fallen, broken people, we have to invite Jesus into that conversation, We have to include him on how do we resolve this? How do we get out of this? How do you look like Jesus and I look like Jesus and we look like Jesus as a couple? This invitation is both to individuals and it is is an invitation to us as couples. When I was a younger man, I loved playing sports and I played a bunch when I was a kid. Uh, By the time I got into high school, I had narrowed it down to football and wrestling. By the time I graduated high school, I was just only wrestled. I started wrestling whenever I was in eighth grade, and I went two and eight that first year. My two wins were by forefoot, which means the other team did not have people in my weight class. But, but I stuck with the team, man. I was on there, and I went to practices, and I, and I lost weight, and I got in shape, and I learned some ways to wrestle, and I slowly got a little bit better over the years. My I peaked, or maybe my highlight came my junior year of high school whenever I found myself in the midst of the state tournament. So Indiana, and I'd imagine Delaware has this, has a tournament where literally all varsity wrestlers kind of go into this, and and there's meets all over the state, and the people who are doing well in these meets advance, you know, in advance, and that pot continues to, to narrow until you would eventually crown a state champion for the whole state of Indiana in each individual weight class pretty big deal if if you wrestle. And so I had found myself in a match that if I won this one, I went to the semifinals. It was a place that I never thought that I would find myself in. And whenever I got the pairings, they paired me against a man child in a high schooler's (laughs) wrestling uniform. And so we go out into this mat and the biggest arena that I had ever been able to wrestle in. and, And this guy staring at me and glaring at me and I'm smiling back because I'm Eric and and so then we start wrestling and and if you don't know anything about wrestling wrestling is is just two people right it's just just one versus one and the ultimate win is to get your opponent held flat on the ground for three seconds and then you pin them or to fall. There's other ways to get points. You can win by points by you know, getting them down on the mat or maybe getting them on their back for a, minute, a second or two and you get some points. But this is the ultimate that you're shooting for. And, and so me and this guy are circling and all of a sudden he just drops his arms to the side, leaving himself completely exposed to whatever kind of attack that I'm going to have. And I was quick, man. I was excited, I was, I was in this match all on. And so I, I shot in on him, which means I went down on one knee and I jammed my shoulder into his midsection. You know, and you do that in hopes that you knock him off balance and you knock him down. And man, he didn't budge. <laughs> so I wrapped my arms around his legs and I pulled his legs into me again, kind of hoping that he's going to fall and he didn't budge. So what he did do though is he... Standing here looking at me, he kind of shoves his hands down his knees into my armpits and pries me off like I would have done when my kids were young. And he sets me down on my back and pins me in 28 seconds. The most humiliating moment in anything that I ever did in high school. It was a horrible experience that I still think I wake up with nightmares for. But I share this little trip down memory lane because whenever I think about it, it really means something to me. You see, I loved being part of our wrestling team. I loved the camaraderie, the friendship. I loved working out and getting in shape. I loved whenever I won a match. I really loved getting to wear my cool Franklin Central wrestling team sweatshirt through the hallways of the high school on match days. This guy was a wrestler. I invested some in my wrestling career. But I didn't do the things this man did. Whenever I was faced with real adversity, with a real opponent, I had nothing in my tool belt to battle him with. Sometimes I'm afraid that as Christians, we just like to wear our sweatshirts through the hallways 
on match day. You know, just coming to church on a Sunday morning for an hour does not strongly develop our relationship with Jesus. Jesus knows that in order for that to grow, for that to develop, we have to be yoked with him. You know, life is fun and exciting. Any sort of new relationship comes with lots of anticipation. I shared this picture of Marcy and I whenever we first had gotten engaged. That was like the day after we got, got engaged. It was three months into our relationship. There was so much excitement, so much enthusiasm. I, I literally just cherished that I have that moment. I think I told you, we printed out this picture. We have it upstairs in our house. We love it, but we had no idea what was in store for us whenever we stepped into that relationship, right? What God had in store for us as we started this relationship was this. We never would have known all this was coming. We never would have known that we would have two houses. We would have a major life change. That God would bless us with six children and six grandchildren. And an opportunity to do ministry. To come to a place like Delaware and to be able to preach God's word. Like we had no idea what he had in store for us. And we don't know what Jesus has in store for us until we yoke ourselves with him. And we do relationship with him. What Jesus wants is a real relationship with him. The relationship that he has for us generates fruit that we never could imagine and it generates rest for our souls. Do you know what in real life tangible ways rest for our souls looks like? I jotted down a couple ideas. It looks like not being mad whenever I have to wait in line at the grocery store or the fast food line, or maybe even a train track. It's not having to go into full crisis mode when my car breaks down, or when the dryer goes out, or really when anything mechanical in our home breaks down. It's having enough margin in my life to stop and help somebody change a flat tire, or pray for them, or dare I say it, help them move. Mm. Or having a conversation with somebody who has hurt me instead of lashing out, talking behind their back, or posting about them on Facebook. You see, rest for our souls doesn't take away life's troubles, but it certainly helps us respond to them in a Christ-like manner. I want to leave today with some practical ideas. I would never want to share a message and say, You need to go be yoked with Jesus and not give you some ideas on how to be yoked with Jesus. So I have three suggestions on how we can nurture this relationship. They are not a magic bullet. The magic bullet is the intentionality in which we spend time with Jesus when we put ourselves in a posture to hear from them. These are three pretty pretty pivotal ideals for me, and I want to share those. One is to read your Bible. We have to read our Bible I hear many times I don't understand what I read or I don't read all that well. And I appreciate that and I respect that, and respect that honesty. If you struggle to understand what you read, they have audio Bibles that you can, you can buy them, you can rent them. They are online where you can just sit with your computer or even like a smart speaker would play it for us. A lady shared yesterday at the retreat that she likes to listen to the Bible at night whenever she can't read. Hardly nobody understands the Bible when they first start reading it. I know some really, really intelligent men, women. I put Mark in that category. I guarantee you the first time Mark started reading his Bible, it didn't all just click, but he kept going back to it. He kept reading it. That generated questions that then he studied and he had other conversations. And now we can look to him as a church leader because it started with him starting to read his Bible. We have to read our Bible. We need to pray. If we are married, we need to pray with our spouse every single day. It doesn't have to be beautiful. It doesn't have to be articulate. It needs to be a couple holding hands, praying. The most intimate thing you will ever do as a couple. If you have children, you need to pray with your children. Pray over your children. James, the brother of Jesus, said that we need to pray when things are good, pray when things are bad. We need to pray whenever we need healing. We need to invite the elders to come in and pray with us. We need to pray. I would also encourage you that when you pray, 
Take some time being still. I had a good friend tell me one time that the only real way to come to Jesus open-handed to allow Jesus to speak to us is to be quiet and let Jesus speak to us. And he's, he's not going to speak to you in an audible voice, I don't think. I feel pretty safe saying that. He's never talked to me. I don't have any friends who he said he's ever spoke audibly to. But he will speak to your heart. He will bring up somebody for you to pray about, reach out to, to help. He will convict you to share with somebody in some way, to engage with them. Jesus will speak to us, but we have to practice hearing his voice so that we recognize his voice when he does speak. And finally, get involved in church. Get involved in church. There's tons of ways to get involved in a church, especially a great church like this. You can serve in the children's ministry, in the student ministry. You can make coffee. There's an art. We can't have enough coffee makers. That's what I say. There's, there's folks holding doors open, and there's just people serving in so many ways around this church. You can get involved into a life group. The whole goal here, the work is great, right? But the, but the benefit to this is the community that we develop, the friendships that we make. People here are not perfect. Hopefully that doesn't surprise anyone. If, if anyone here was perfect, you wouldn't need to be here. So, so that's important to recognize that as you do develop these relationships, but you're making friends with people who are also pursuing a relentless relationship with Jesus Christ. That is so important. That so much helps our own personal walk and helps us connect with Jesus. Today's message is about changing our life. Changing takes intentionality. Intentionality is hard, and I know that. This kind of change is so restful and peaceful and so fulfilling for our heart. It literally reminds me of when I was just a little boy and I would sit in my mom's lap in her black rocking chair and she would read me the story about the prince who every time he counted the people in his kingdom was one short because he forgot to count himself. And I remember sitting in mom's lap and I remember that book. Jesus wants to be yoked with us. He wants to do life with us. He wants to heal us from the inside out. My dad was a paraplegic before he passed away. He lived 13 years after his accident. And any paraplegic battles pressure sores or bed sores really bad. They say that a pressure sore can begin in like 15 minutes of being dormant. And so it's very, very common. Dad had some that were, were pretty, you know, substantial. He had one in particular that they, they noticed right away, even with treatment, it continued to get worse, continued to get worse. They did uh, cleanings. They did, you know, uh, packing it. They did uh, some surgeries to remove stuff, hoping it would rejuvenate skin. They did a, a skin flap. His was on his tailbone. They removed his tailbone like they could not get rid of this bed sore. And just the whole time they worked on it, it just got worse and worse and worse and worse. And eventually they, they inserted a tube into the center of the sore and they pulled stuff out constantly for weeks and months this went on and there was no change and there was no change and there was one, no change and all of a sudden he was healed. It was healing from the inside, and none of us could see that. And then one day, he was healed on the outside. That's what Jesus wants to do for us. He invites us to come to me. Yoke yourself with me, and Jesus will be all the difference that we need. I'd love to pray with you guys, and will you please promise to do something this week to help yourself yoke with Jesus. God, I love you, and I worship you. I thank you, Jesus, for your word and your invitation to know you and to love you and to do life with you. So, Jesus, please do the heavy lifting for me. Remind me whenever I have downtime to spend time with you, to invite you into the conversations, to invite you into my marriage. I love you, Jesus. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.